Turn in your Bibles today, if you will, to the Gospel according to Luke. Dr. Luke. And when you find your Bible and you find the book of Luke, if you would please, turn to the 19th chapter. And we begin reading in verse number one. While you're turning, let me say again, thank you for being in your places today. It's good to see you. You're visiting with us. Good to have Alfonso back. He's been out sick. We missed you. It's good to have you back. God bless you, brother. And uh, others that might have been out and you're back today, we're glad to see you. Thank you for being in the Lord's house. Luke chapter number 19, verse number one. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Lord, I want to thank you today for the wonderful songs, those who participated. And I want to ask you today, now, during these very few precious moments we have together, to help me to take advantage of this time, not waste it, but Lord, help me to say exactly and precisely what you would have me to say. And then I ask that you will give us intake, input, to receive with meekness the engrafted Word of God. Speak to our hearts, and we'll thank you, and we'll praise you, because we make this prayer in the name of Jesus, and for His sake, amen. Thank you. I want you to note in verse number 1, our Bible tells us that Jesus entered and he passed through Jericho. Although that is not the sermon, that could be the sermon. Our Lord Jesus is on his way to the cross. His destination is Jerusalem. They tell us that from the place he had been preaching, to Jerusalem, had a shorter route. But our Lord did not take the shorter route. There was a man down in Jericho that needed to be saved, needed to have his sins forgiven. He was a crook. And when I say he was a crook, a tax collector was a person that the crooks looked down upon. Because the tax collector was the lowest of the low. As a matter of fact, when someone was tried before a judge, they would never allow a tax collector to testify in a court of law. They didn't believe a tax collector could be trusted. For the simple reason, 
he worked for Rome. At that particular time, there were three places, three major places, terminals in the Roman Empire where people like Zacchaeus and Matthew collected taxes. Uh, they collected them at Capernaum. And then they collected taxes at Jericho. And then they collected taxes at Jerusalem. The Bible says that Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector. That simply means that he was the kingpin of a Jericho cartel. He was, he was filthy rich simply because Rome said to the tax collectors, here's the amount of money we want you to collect from the citizens of Capernaum, of Jericho, of Jerusalem. Anything above and beyond that you collect, it's yours. It belongs to you. So Zacchaeus became filthy rich because he took advantage of the people in Jericho. He literally robbed the people. He took from the people. If a person could not pay their taxes in those days, they would take out a, a lease against them. Uh, they could take their homes away from them. They could even be put in jail if they failed to pay their taxes. Tax collectors were people who were not trusted. They were wicked people. They were mean people. They were depraved people. And yet the good news is, in verse number 1, Jesus had an appointment with Zacchaeus. Because Zacchaeus, in his sinful, depraved condition, needed to have a personal one-on-one -on -one meeting with the Lord Jesus Christ. He needed his nature changed. Uh, he needed to know who Christ is was and who Christ is. And so the Bible said that Jesus entered and he passed through Jericho in order that he might make a difference in a wicked sinner's life. By the way, Jesus entered and passed through planet earth 2,000 years ago that he might make wicked sinners, saints, in the presence of the Lord. Nobody in the history of the world, nobody, no one, has ever impacted the world like Jesus Christ has impacted the world. If you take all of the acclaim of all of the other religious leaders of the world, and it was possible just to add it up and total it, it would be minimal compared to the influence that Jesus Christ had. He came to this world in what we call the incarnation. God visited here. Why? Because like Zacchaeus, like the city of Jericho had a curse placed upon it in the book of Joshua in the Old Testament. Like the city of Jericho, all of us, no matter who we are, no matter which side of the tracks we, we, we came from, uh, no matter what the, what the total of our bank account and our savings and our, our, all of the things that we hail and all of the things we acclaim in this world, it cannot buy us one inch towards heaven. We are under the curse also. We have all sinned. And God knowing that and knowing us individual and individually sent his son. He came to this world. Thank God like he went to Jericho and he passed through on his way back to glory. And he left a pathway for us to follow so that we can go and spend eternity with him. What a Savior. You know, everybody in this building today has a choice to make. You can go to heaven. It's not a dream to be awakened from. It's not a fairy tale that you read in some book somewhere. It is a vivid reality that Jesus entered this world and he passed through. Now listen closely. There are some things in this world 
that will keep you from getting to the one that, that's passing by. And we find it here in our text verses this morning. First of all, I want you to notice what Zacchaeus had to do to get to the Lord Jesus Christ as he was passing through. First of all, Zacchaeus had to run around the crowd. The Bible said that when Jesus was passing by, that he virtually he sought to see him who he was and could not for the press because he was little of stature. He ran before and he climbed up into the sycamore tree. There, now he was a small guy. But there was a vast crowd there following the Lord Jesus Christ. They've heard about his miracles. They've heard his teaching. They probably witnessed some of his miracles. So they're coming out by the hundreds and by the thousands to see the Lord Jesus Christ. And Zacchaeus, and I believe Zacchaeus was, was, was feeling some condemnation in his life. I don't think he was happy living the life he was living. And I believe he was looking for a way out. And he heard about Jesus. And he heard about his teaching. And so he, in order to get to him, he said, I'm not going to allow this crowd to keep me from getting to him. He ran around the crowd, and he got to a sycamore tree. Now, if you know anything about a sycamore tree, they're very slick. I don't know how in the world he got up in it. Somebody said he came down, when Jesus told him to come down, he came down so fast he knocked all the bark off the tree and had not been any bark on it since. But there was bark, no bark on that tree for sure. And he got up in the tree so that he might be able to see Jesus when he passed by. Now I want you to listen closely to me today. Through the years of my ministry, I have witnessed to thousands of people. And you know what I've observed? I've observed that there are people who will not get saved because they're concerned about the crowd. I remember numerous occasions witnessing to people and telling them how to be saved. Going down the Romans road of salvation and showing them that we're all sinners. And that Jesus Christ came and took our place. And that if whosoever will will call upon the name of the Lord, he shall be saved. Not might be saved, not could be saved, but he shall be saved. And I'd get that individual to that particular point. And I said, now look, let's do this. I know you want to go to heaven. I know you don't want to die lost. You don't have to die lost. Jesus has came through, and Jesus will receive you, and Jesus will forgive you, and Jesus will save you. And would you be willing right now to bow your head and invite Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins and to become your Savior? And I always say it like this. If you don't feel comfortable praying that prayer, and you would allow me to help you, if you mean it in your heart, I'll be glad to help you pray the prayer so that you can know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I want you to watch this. I've watched this many, many times. When we get to the point, we're, ready, but we're almost ready to draw the net. And he's ready to pray, or she's ready to pray. When we get to the point, would you bow your head right now? And would you ask the Lord uh, uh, to forgive you and to become your Savior? They kind of look around to the mom or the dad or they'll look around to the husband or the wife or they'll look around to their friends that's standing around and I've actually looked around sometimes and I've seen them sniggering a little I've actually seen them making fun you going to really do this are you going to really pray that prayer are you going to really do what that preacher is asking you to do and you know what multitudes of times multitudes of times I've watched them look around. They're ready. They want to be saved. They want their sins forgiven. And they'll look around at the crowd. They'll look around at the individual. And they don't like the signal the family's sending. Or they don't like the signal the crowd's sending. And you know what they'll say? Well, I know I need to, but not right now. You know what they're doing? They are allowing the crowd to keep them from Jesus Christ. I want to tell you, here's the way it is. There used to be a program on television that they had these doors. I don't even know what to call the program. And they had something behind the door, and you choose which door you want. Do you know that's an illustration of what salvation is? Everybody living on planet Earth is looking at two doors. And let me tell you what's behind those doors. Behind one of those doors, 
There's a literal burning flame called hell where people that listen to the crowd, watch the crowd, observe the crowd, uh, die and spend eternity burning and screaming and suffering for all of eternity. Now look, nobody in their right mind wants to go through that door. Nobody that has enough uh, intelligence to know their name, know their address, know their phone number, know where they live, uh, has the ability to get in their car and drive to church on Sunday morning. Uh, nobody, nobody wants to open the door that goes into the caverns of hell. Nobody wants to do that. But there's a second door. And, and that door is defined in the Gospel of John. Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. And he shall go in and out, and he shall find pastor. I like that. Going through the door and then going in and out. We come in, we get refreshed in Jesus, we go back out. We come in, get refreshed, we go back out. Jesus is not only our Savior, he's our refresher also. So everybody's facing two doors. Nobody in their right mind wants to go to hell. But they are willing to play Russian roulette with their soul. Rather than take the scorn of the crowd or the scorn of a family member that's just determined they're going to go to hell in spite of all of the prayers and all of the preaching and all of the begging and all of the pleading that anybody does, they've just made up their mind they want to go to hell and they want as many people as possible to go with them. Look, I'm not going to hell for anybody. And you ought to make up your mind if you've never been saved. I won't die and go to hell for anybody. Because the good news is, Jesus has passed through. And there's a door you can walk through named Jesus Christ. It's personified. And you can walk through that door knowing that your sins will be forgiven. Knowing that your destination is eternally settled. That Jesus is your Savior. And that heaven is your home. Look, there's not a crowd in this world. Not a crowd in this world. No matter who's in the crowd. No matter uh, what their name. No matter who they are. There's not a crowd in this world that can help you when you're on your deathbed. But there's a Savior who's promised. Uh, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I'm grateful for the Lord Jesus Christ uh, that becomes a greater friend, listen, a greater friend than all of those fair weather friends that would try to keep you from getting to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what? Some people will follow other people as long as they got a dollar in their pocket, but when they, got a, they run out of money and they don't have anything to give, then their fair weather friends, they say, bye-bye, I'll see you later. They were not true friends to begin with. Let me tell you who the true friend is. Let me tell you who the best friend is. Let me tell you who will stick closer than a brother. Let me tell you who will be with you through the valley. Let me tell you who will walk down the road of life in difficult times and good times. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. He will walk with you. Zacchaeus said, I'm not going to let this crowd keep me from getting to Jesus. So he ran around the crowd. Maybe somebody here or somebody listening to me over our radio station, or internet minister or television, you may be looking at the crowd and you may be saying, what will they think? It don't matter what they think. All you've got to do is turn right. When they turn left, and they'll leave you anyway. So the best thing to do is just go ahead and secure your eternity in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, I'll tell you this. I hadn't meant, I hadn't meant to say a lot about it, but I, I feel the Spirit of God nudging me here. Let me tell you something. Right now, right now, we don't want to think about it. I, I watched something the other day. Uh, there was a program on television, and they was making fun of hell. Uh, they said, that's, that's just something to scare people. I want to tell you something. The Son of God who came through, like he went through Jericho, the Son of God who came to this world and went to Calvary's cross, I want you to hear me well, said more about hell than he said about heaven. You know why he did it? He don't want you to go there. And you don't have to because he's already gone there for you. 
You don't have to pay that price. He paid it for you. You don't have to suffer there. He suffered for you. You don't have to go where there's eternal darkness forever and ever. Thank God he's done suffered it for you. You don't have to be abandoned by God forever. He's already been abandoned for you so that you would never be abandoned. What a Savior we serve today. What a wonderful Lord we serve. Zacchaeus said, I've got to get to him. I'm going to run around this crowd. I'm not going to let this crowd stand in my way. And Zacchaeus ran around the crowd. But secondly, I want you to notice something else that's vitally important. Not only did he run around the crowd to get saved, but Zacchaeus used the urgency of the moment to get saved. I want you to notice in verse number 5, Jesus came to the place and he looked up and he saw him and he said unto him, Zacchaeus, you make haste. You make haste, and, uh, and you come down, because today, notice the word. He said, today, I must abide at your house. Now listen, you better make haste while you can. Don't waste the moment. I wish there was some way that I could help you to see and help you to understand how important it is if you're lost and you get saved today. I wish there was some way I could help you to understand. If you're saved and you're in a foreign country, how important it is for you to get back to the Father's house. Because we're facing eternity in just a few short days. Compared to eternity in just a few short days, it's all going to be over. And the zephyrs of eternity are going to be singing their songs over our graves because we are going to be in eternity. And this thing requires haste. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? There's multitudes of people in the United States of America who are not in church today because last Sunday they heard their last sermon. They didn't know it was their last ser sermon. They got in their car. They went out to lunch. They had a good time. Suddenly something happened, automobile accident, a heart attack, stroke. Uh, shooting, something happened. I was just this week reading about a missionary and his wife on the foreign field. They'd only been on the foreign field for two weeks. Had seven or eight kids. I was looking at your picture this morning. Had seven or eight kids. He's been on the field for two weeks driving down the highway and somebody shoots through the window and kills him. Last thing he thought when he went to the mission field was that two weeks I'll be in eternity. Multitudes of people left the house of God last week. And the last thought in their mind was that this Sunday they'd be in eternity, but they're there. Who knows who in this building will be in eternity this time next week. Jesus is passing by, but he's just passing by right now. And you need to make haste while he's passing by. And while you still have the intelligence to get saved. While you still have the feeling of the need to get saved. While you still realize it's important to get saved. You need to be like Zacchaeus. You need to make haste and get down the tree and get to Jesus. Jesus while you can. The first church I pastored many years ago in Yadkin County was located near Boonville, North Carolina. I have, re I have relived this dozens and dozens of times in my life. I preached the message on Sunday morning, and then we had the invitation. About halfway through the, the first or second verse of the invitation, on my left, about three pews from the back, and the auditorium was kind of laid out like this. There were two aisles. Yeah, two aisles. And on my left, back at the back of the auditorium, while the invitation is being rendered, there's a young man back there, handsome-looking young man, I notice he's standing there, and it's one of those situations where you can just, he's under conviction, he's got his hands on the back of the pew just like that, he's got his head down. And he's kind of moving, shuffling his feet, and it's very obvious to tell that this, this young man's under conviction. This young man needs to get saved. And while they're singing, I watched him. And I began to pray that God would so burden him and convict him that he'd come get saved. I watched that young man do this, like this is the pew where he was standing. I watched him do this. He stepped out in the aisle. He took about one step towards the altar. 
He pulled his foot back. He stepped back behind that pew. He got back in his place. He grabbed a hold of the back of that pew under deep conviction. But he did not move. I was so burdened. I had them to extend the invitation another stanza. I'm hoping that this time he will listen to the overtures of the Holy Spirit and he will come forward and trust Christ as his Savior. I could tell he's moving, shuffling his feet. His knuckles are extremely white where he's gripping the back of that pew under deep conviction. He didn't come. I kept on. I extended that invitation, I think, two more stanzas. He never came. I was so burdened. When the service was over, I was standing at the door shaking hands. I could see him as he come out under deep conviction. I said, could I help you? Not right now. Not right now. I went home that afternoon, and I was so burdened over that young man. Went back to church that night. He wasn't there. Service was over. Went, went to the parsonage. Went on to bed. About 5 o'clock, as well as I remember, the next morning, my phone rang. And somebody on the phone, who was a member of the church I was passing at that time, they said, Pastor Beatty. I said, Yes. Do you by chance remember a young man who stood in the church yesterday morning on your left, back at the back of the church? Do you remember that? I said, I sure do. I really do. I sure remember that. They said, uh, Pastor, has anybody told you what's happened? I said, no, I haven't heard anything. They said, that young man lost his life last night. He's in eternity. I broke down. I wept. I couldn't believe it. That man stood in the back of the church. I pastor stepped in the aisle and stepped back and did not get saved. Unless something happened from that time until the early hours of Monday morning. As I stand in this pulpit right now, that young man is in a, a Christless eternity. Oh, my soul. Jesus was passing by. He didn't know it that day. That would be the last service he would ever attend. He had no idea that day that that time the next day on Monday uh, he would be in eternity. Uh, he came for the last time. When he walked out, that was the last time he'd walk across a parking lot in a church. That was the last time he'd sit in a church pew. That was the last time he'd grip a hole by conviction in the back of the pew. That was the last time he'd hear the gospel. And that was the last time he would ever hear an invitation song rendered. Maybe somebody listening to me today that's right where that young man's at. You say, I don't think so. You couldn't guarantee it otherwise. Life is like a vapor. It appears for a little while. And then it vanisheth away. I want you to note, Zacchaeus realized there was the urgency of the moment. And Jesus said, make haste and come down. I want to say next, in verse number 5, this is very interesting that Zacchaeus received a personal call from Jesus. Notice, if you will, Jesus came to the place and looked up. I find this very interesting. He came to the place and he looked up. You know, I think they probably made fun of Zacchaeus, people in that day, because the word Zacchaeus means pure. When his parents named him, they said, we hope to have a pure boy. He was everything but that. When they went out in public and somebody said, how are you doing, Mr. Pierre? They probably laughed because they knew he was a crook. But Jesus came by. Hear me well. They had never met so far as we know. But Jesus knew who he was. When Jesus came to the tree, he looked up and he called him by his name. And he said, Zacchaeus. Hear me, he knows you by your name today. 
You're not a stranger to him. He knows exactly who you are. He knows exactly where you're at right now. He knows exactly where you live. He knows all about your life. He knows about every sin you've ever committed, every story you've ever told. Uh, he knows everything about you. There's nothing hidden from him who sees all things. Daylight and darkness are the same in his sight. He knows you individually, and he still loves you, and he still wants to forgive you, and he still wants to save you. The crookedest man in Jericho was Zacchaeus, and Jesus went straight to him. You know why? Because he received of sinners, and he knew him by name. When I got saved on this side of the altar, in a little old basement church, as a teenager many years ago, he knew me by name. When I went down to that altar, he knew exactly who I was. So notice, he knew him by name. Now, I want you to hear me well. It's vitally important that we understand this will be the last time Jesus would ever go through Jericho. Jesus is on his way to Calvary's cross, and he will not be coming this way anymore. He won't be back. To Zacchaeus, unknown to him at that moment, he had one last chance to meet the Savior. If he, met, if, he, if he failed to meet the Savior that day, he sealed his eternal destiny because Jesus would not be coming back again. I want you to listen closely to what I'm about to tell you. Every single time in your life when you say no to Jesus Christ, whether you be a saint or a sinner, you are positioning yourself to be able to say no easier the next time. Just like the sun shining on the ground or shining on some fruit, it will either soften it or harden it. And when the Spirit of God speaks to you about your soul, your never dying soul, and you say no, after a period of time, it becomes easier to say no. If you're saved and the Spirit of God's calling you back where you ought to be as a Christian and you say no before you realize it, it becomes easier to say no. It becomes easier to shut him out of your life. That's the reason the Bible says in the book of Corinthians, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Why? You don't have the assurance of tomorrow. Jesus is passing by to Jericho one last time. He will never be through again. He's going to Calvary to die for the sins of the world. And Zacchaeus, you better make haste and get with him now. Because if you don't, you'll, you'll miss your last chance to get saved. Uh, I believe the Holy Spirit is long-suffering. God is long-suffering. Not willing that any should perish. But I believe there comes a time like the end of Lubin time when God looked down over this lost sinful world and said, My spirit shall not always strive with men. I I believe when you say no to the Holy Spirit and you keep saying no to the Holy Spirit and you keep saying no to the Holy Spirit, it just might be that the Holy Spirit will say, okay, if you want to go to hell, I'll let you go. I've told the story here before. I'll never forget my pastor telling the story going to the hospital to pray for one of his members. And the member was lost, and the, uh, the man was lost, and his wife was a member of his church, uh, and she had asked the preacher to go by and try to win her husband to the Lord. And my pastor went by the hospital and talked to the man, and then finally wove the conversation around and said, wouldn't you like to get saved today? He said, I would, but I can't. And my preacher said, why can't you? God loves you. God wants to give you. He said, listen, preacher. He said, as I was coming along down the journey of life, I had a lot of things to do. I had a lot of plans in my life. And he said, God wasn't a part of my plan. And he said, I'd get in a church service with my wife, and the preacher would give the invitation, and he'd preach just to me. It was very obvious. And God was dealing with me. 
He said, I had a lot of dreams. I had a lot of aspirations. I had a lot of self-imposed goals I was going to put into my life. He said, I had a lot of things I determined I was going to do, and I didn't have time for him. And he said, I got tired of him convicting me, and I got tired of him pressing me to get saved. And he said, Preacher, one day in an invitation, I felt him once again burdening me and convicting me to get saved. And he said, in that invitation, I told God, if you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. And my preacher said that man laying in that hospital bed took his hand and laid it over on the side of the cold sheet rock wall. And he said to my pastor, Pastor, from that day to this day, God has kept his promise. He said, my heart, my soul is as cold as a plaster on this wall. He said, I haven't felt God since that time. He said, I asked him to leave me alone, and he's left me alone. He said, Preacher, I'm going to hell. You don't have any plans today as important as the plan of getting your soul's satisfaction fixed. There's nothing today that's as important as getting saved. There's nothing today as important to, to following the overtures of the convicting power of the Holy Spirit of God. While Jesus is passing by, he may not be by again. Let me say this in closing. When Jesus passes by and you yield to him, your life gets transformed. If there was no difference in getting saved and living lost, it's all a hoax anyway. But I'm here to tell you, getting saved changes your life. Hallelujah. We become a new cre creation in Christ Jesus. Notice what happened here. His life was transformed. Notice in verse 9, Jesus said to him this day, Is salvation come to this house? That was the greatest gift Zacchaeus had ever received. Now, he received some wonderful gifts from his perspective as he was robbing the people. But he never received a gift as great as the gift that Jesus just gave him. That day he got saved. And Jesus said, it's, uh, salvation is, I like this, salvation is come to this house. Well, wait a minute, look at the next verse. Look at the next verse. Look at verse number 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. That takes you in. He said to Zacchaeus personally, I come down here to get you, buddy. But he said, I want you to know to the world, Luke, you write this down, that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. I want you to notice what he's doing before he saves. He seeks. Do you notice what he did to Zacchaeus? He went out of his way to get there to save that man. He sought him out. Called him by his name. You know what the little lady over there at the well was doing? She'd already been married about, or lived with about five different men, and the man she was living with at that point wasn't her husband. And Jesus went out of his way and traveled over roads that Jews didn't really travel over uh, to get to that little lady down there at the well uh, because she needed to drink from a fountain that would never run dry. And that day she met the master. He went out of his way to seek that little lady. They said, Lord, what are you going this way for? Jews don't travel on these Gentile roads. He said, there's there's a little lady down there. She's sitting on the well, and she needs a different kind of well. She needs a well springing up in her soul that will transform her life and change her and make her a new creation. And he went out of his well, and he said, Would you like to have some water? And she said, Yes, Lord. He said, The water that I'm going to give you is going to be like an artesian well. It's going to be springing up in your soul forever and ever. He said, If you drink of this physical water, you will thirst again. But if you drink of the water that I I give you. Your thirst is ended. You will never thirst again. And I can truthfully say as a teenager, I got in on the well, and it's been bubbling and springing ever since. Thank God Jesus satisfies. It's better than Social Security. Amen. He was transformed. In closing, let me show you what happened to him when he got saved. Salvation produces results. In verse number 8, he stood. And he said, Lord, I want you to know something. Half of my goods I'm going to give to the poor. 
And if I've taken anything from any man but false accusation, out of what I've got left after I give half of it away, I'm willing to restore him fourfold. You know what happened? He got saved. You know what happened? Salvation loosed the purse strings on his billfold. You say, preacher, this thing's been going pretty good right now. I only point you to the scripture. It was here before I came along. When the man got saved, the man that had been spending all of his life taking now wants to spend the rest of his life giving. You know why? Because God got in his heart and in his back pocket. Saved people need to give their finances while they're living so they'll know where it's going. Twice born people have no problem supporting the institution that Jesus died for. And I find something here very interesting that our, that our Savior said. Notice this, if you will, in verse 8, Zacchaeus stood and said unto, and look at this, here's another message, I'm sorry, I don't want to disappoint you, but I'm not going to have time to finish it. But Zacchaeus in verse number 8 stood and said, uh, notice, who he, notice who Jesus is to him now, Lord. Back in verse number 3, he sought to see Jesus, who he was. But now he's found out that he's Lord, Master Adonai of his life. And he said, Lord, the half of my goods I give forth, if I've taken anything to the end of my false accusation, I restore him four day, uh, fourfold. Now notice what Jesus said. He said, this day salvation came to his house. Why did Jesus say that? Well, he didn't, he didn't get saved because of what he gave away. He got saved because of the person he received. But when he received the person, suddenly the purse strings come loose. Uh, and Jesus said, now, notice when Jesus said, now salvation come to this house. After he proved by his action that he meant business with Jesus. Wow. You say, preacher, you're talking about money right now. I'm so glad you figured it out. Because if you boil it all down, we're going to have an invitation. If you boil it all down, a full 15% of what Jesus talked about recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, a full 15% of what he said had to do with finances and money. Jesus spoke more about money and finances than he did about heaven. And he spoke more about money and finances than he did about hell. It was important. You know why? Because in order for the church to survive, it has to have the giving of the people who are members of that church. And that makes it important because the church is the institution that gives out the wonderful gospel. And Jesus said, I want this thing supported and I want it continually given out. And the way we do that is we bring our tithes and offerings into the house of the Lord. And saved people don't have a problem with that. It's the skin flints that have the problem with it. Go ahead and smile. It won't crack. It's not a burden for me to give. It's a blessing. You know why? Because he puts it in my hands that I can put it back in his hand. And every week of my life, I tithe to this church and I give an offering over me. I do it personally. I'm not preaching something to you that I don't do. You say, well, preacher, I appreciate that and, and, and I bring a little money into the Brian Baptist Church and I support Joel. Well, the next time you go to the hospital, you call Joel and tell him to come and visit you. The next time your loved one dies, you get Joel and his wife on the phone and say, I need you to come and preach the funeral of my loved ones. You'll be fortunate if you even get them on the phone. You say, well, they really feed me. They feed you garbage that you don't need. You need truth more than garbage. You say, you're talking about my favorite people. You get on the right side and look across the fence in the right way, you'll find that the grass in that direction is not green, it's brown. No reflection, Brother Brown. But uh, 
I want you to notice, Jesus passed by. And Zacchaeus got his life changed and transformed. Where are you at today? Let me ask you this. How many times have you said no to Jesus, lost person? You better thank God that you're still here today to be able to say something again. Christian, was there a time in your life when you felt closer to God than you do right now? You ought to get up out of your seat even before we start the invitation. Get around this altar and say, Lord, you're passing through today. You just helped me see and you've enabled me to know I'm not as close to you as I need to be, as I used to be. I want to get around the altar and get it right. Don't close out your life on the other side of the tracks. Close out your life loving Jesus the way you ought to love Jesus. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Jesus is passing by today. He's here. Just like he passed by Zacchaeus, he's passing by here today. And if you need to come, I want you to step out and come. Make your way here around this altar. As God speaks to you, would you just come on down? How many with our heads bowed, eyes closed, would raise your hand and say, Preacher, God spoke to me today. If he didn't speak to anybody else, he spoke to me. I, I, I want to acknowledge it today. Would you slip your hand up all over the building? Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Lord, you see the hands today. I know you burdened me with this message for, for a reason. And Lord, uh, somebody here in this auditorium is going to be next as far as eternity is concerned. We don't know which one it is. But we want everybody to be ready.